Hello and welcome to Where Living is a Vacation. I'm Joe Johnson and I am joined once again by Jimmy Johnson. Hello. No relation that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> But uh, school is in session. We are back to school. Labor yes. Day weekend has come and gone, and uh, new things are in store for Lake Orion students. We got some exciting things to talk about. But what we're going to do on this episode of Where Living is a Vacation is we're going to go over the history of Lake Orion schools. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fascinating history that goes back to the earliest days of Lake Orion and has evolved over time. And yes. when I started to research this topic, I stumbled across this amazing document that I found online that basically tells the entire history of the school district. So it saved me a lot of work. It saved me a lot of work as well because <laughs> it was pretty detailed and I'm glad somebody took the time to catalog it. <laughs> yeah. Because you can get lost pretty quick. You, know, you have any <laughs> idea who's responsible for it? I wish uh, we can give them credit. I first saw it, I think, on the Lake Orion Schools website because yeah. I started looking about uh, researching about schools and yeah, I stumbled upon Lake Orion Community Schools and like, wow, somebody put this together. Yeah. They it's put great. a lot of effort yeah. into it and it's much yep. appreciated. Um, now you have the website where living is a vacation, the Facebook page, and you post interesting tidbits about Lo uh, Lake Orient's past, including yes. its schools. And uh, yep. I'm sure people really appreciate that and get a kick out of those little uh, history nuggets. Yeah, and this, uh, just recently, you know, with school being back in, there's there's a lot of uh, like yearbooks you can find online, old historical yearbooks of Lake Orion. You mm -hmm. kind of see the names you see something like van wagner you see uh, like advertisers and it just brings back a a flood of memories of like you start connecting all the dots of who was where at that time period yeah. <laughs> now as a kid you know it's kind of a mixed blessing summer has come to an end but they're going back to school is an exciting time that's where all my yeah. friends were and when I was a kid, I didn't live near my friends, and so I didn't really see them throughout the entire summer. And so yeah. when school started, it was back to hanging out with my friends and having fun. Yep. And then back then, yeah, with schoolhouses, there was many schoolhouses around, you know, everywhere in this area. And, uh, you know, they wanted to make it something that's close for people to, for students, at least uh, at a minimum, a two-mile walk to it. And you think, oh, two miles now, like, Mm. So my, um, my kids go on to the edge of the driveway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but two miles <laughs> to a school is amazing. And they had chores they had to do. They had all the stuff they had to do and yeah. to get the, the school started in the morning. So it's like you hear those crazy. stories. You know, when I was a kid, I had to walk a mile in the snow. But here in Lake Orion, that was true. Yep, yep. That was literally true. <laughs> yeah. So there were a lot of one-room yeah. schoolhouses in Lake Orion uh, during its earliest days, according to this article. Uh, right around the time when Lake Orion was in its infancy, when it was called Canandagua still, yeah. uh, apparently there was a private school run by a man named Collins uh, in a building mm -hmm. which had been Lake Orion's first inn. And according to this, it was located west of the current Elizabeth Street School on the north side of the street near the old railroad tracks. So oh, I would imagine yeah. right there at Lapeer Road mm -hmm. and Elizabeth Street. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I don't know what's there right now. I'd have to look at Google. I'm on there. It's like one of those corners. It, you know, it could be the AutoZone corner. It could be. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, according to this, the first public school, which was built in 1844, mm -hmm. is still standing today. And I have some video of it. It is a little house not far from uh, Village Hall in the old uh, in, uh, church there mm -hmm. but that residence that you see uh, was Lake Orion's first public school and it's amazing to me that it still exists now I was there shooting some video it when I was there I saw a, a, a real estate sign that yeah. said it was a for sale and I was able to shoot some video of the interiors there but you have some uh, a new update about that particular house what did you learn yeah as I, recently I posted this on the, the Facebook page for we're living vacation and and someone said, oh, we, we're going to be purchasing this house or in the process of purchasing this house. What's the history of this? So it was, it was great to just connect those dots there and, you know, be able to share some of that history. And, you know, and even like who was the first uh, teacher there, you know, there was a, a Mr. Dolby mm. who was a teacher there. It's like, wow, it's amazing this, uh, this house 
uh, was a school along with all these many other smaller schoolhouses <laughs> serving yeah. the community. Now, you said uh, that, describe the environment of the one-room schoolhouse during that time period in Lake Orion. Yeah, so during that time period, from what I've read and researched, that's, you know, kids took care of the school. You know, so you walk two miles to school, yes, but you'd have to get there beforehand. So if school started at 9, in the wintertime, you had to get there at like 7.30, 7 o'clock. You had to put, take the wood, put it in the fire to make sure the, the schoolhouse is warmed up. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the older students would do that, the younger students, each one had a job. So even the younger students were, you know, cleaning the blackboards, um, taking care of the lunch. So everybody had tasks. So uh, not like how the school systems today where you have everybody in place to make sure all the amenities are there. Uh, they were getting an education as well as real life experience, like taking care of a school. So. Yeah. That's amazing. I can't help but picture the little rascals. Remember the little rascals with Miss Crabtree yes. and stuff like that? Uh, that? I bet you that's a lot of what it was like yeah. back then. Yeah. yeah, I have a picture actually of this. Uh, this is one of the rural schools. This is the, the Wilson mm -hmm. Rural School. So this one was one room schoolhouse um, located at the corner of Joslin and Walden. So on the northwest corner. So what's right there now is obviously apartments. But uh, yeah, that little person right there is actually <laughs> Mildred Gingell. Wow. So this is from 1916. Of Gingellville fame and yes. Mike Gingell, who currently uh, sits on the uh, Oakland County Board of Commissioners, his family has deep, deep yeah. roots in Orient Township. Lake I wonder Orient. if he knows about this photo. <laughs> yeah, so that's obviously one of his ancestors yeah. standing there in front of that building. And the teacher, the teacher took the photo, a uh, uh, Whitney Hames was the teacher at the time and took that took that photo and it's just it's a good like uh you know snapshot in time you see in the background is like you just open land one schoolhouse i see probably like a, an outhouse in the in the back corner there so or <laughs> detention room i don't know but <laughs> <laughs> wow but yeah that's amazing now that area elizabeth street uh area there um that's obviously has deep, deep roots in Lake Orion. Uh, the first, I guess you would, you want to call it a high school, but really it was all grades, right? It was like kindergarten through 12th grade, but yep. there was a high school that predates the existing Elizabeth Street School that's there now. That was considered the first high school. What do you know about that first school? Yeah, that first school, I, have a, I actually have a picture of that one as well. It's 1893. Wow. So yeah, served grades one through 12. Uh, located in the same corner that uh, the current school's at, Elizabeth and Lapeer. Uh, it's one of, th one of the finest schools in the state. It was classified as that, uh, doing my research. Uh, Charles Lineberry was the principal. Enrollment, 139 students, um, and it's four stories. It had such, you know, from afar, you can see this just sitting on the hillside, just how, how tall it was, and you can see the big bell tower at the top. But uh, over time, this was demolished. Unfortunately, it's a nice looking school, but mm. uh, part of the Works Progress Program uh, administration project that Franklin, Delavo, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt had in 1927 to help provide jobs, um, they deemed the school to expand, leveled mm -hmm. it, and built the school that you see there today. Yeah, so in 1927, the current school that exists uh, at Elizabeth Street, which is now known as the Eman Center, mm -hmm. that became the state-of-the-art school for Lake Orion uh, students in 1927 when it opens its doors. Uh, it's, it's, it reminds me of yeah. the school from A Christmas Story. Um, it just yeah. has that vibe. And I've been yep. lucky enough to uh, have been inside that building. And I mm. talked to some of the older residents here in Lake Orion who actually went to school there, which is fascinating. Yeah. And um, there was a group, a group of investors purchased that building and was hoping to turn it into kind of a combination residential, plus they were thinking of maybe putting a, a restaurant in the gymnasium or whatever. Yeah. And so when they uh, had a tour of the school, they invited me to uh, come along. And that was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be able to get into that building and take a look around. And I don't know if you've ever seen this video. 
But here's a little tour of what the inside of, of that current Elizabeth Street School looks like. Built in 1927, this building located at 55 Elizabeth Street served as Lake Orion's second school, housing grades K through 12 for 30 years. The two-story, 35,000 square foot building has 25 classrooms and a gymnasium. Over the years, the building housed the school district's adult education and latchkey programs. Lake Orion resident Wendy Patton purchased the building in 2001, allowing the Boys and Girls Club to occupy the building until 2006, and Love Inc. utilized space in the building until 2008. Over the past few years, the historic building has sat unused, and Oakland County took over ownership following a tax foreclosure in 2013. Now a group of investors calling themselves Legacy LO purchased the building with major plans to develop classrooms into residential units while maintaining the charm of the exterior. There's even a proposal to convert the gymnasium into a restaurant. What's really unique about this building, and, and I'm going to give the village and the DDA so much credit because do they like to look at a school that's you know old and dilapidated? No, but the ideas that were before this were worn out ideas. You know, people, they just didn't feel like that's gonna revive this downtown. And so that's when, when we all thought about the city style lofts and bringing you know, a, a demographic to the village. Um, they loved it and they really were incredible. I mean, in helping us get the school. We are really pumped about going through the whole process of working with the folks uh, for, this, for the approvals. Uh, we're in the process of looking at three or four historical architects that can help us really you know, position the asset accordingly. Um, there's a lot of work to do. We've got to raise a lot of money. So how cool is it to see those empty yeah. classrooms and hallways? Not a lot of people uh, have been able to get into that building since it closed its doors, even no. though there are still a lot of residents who actually attended that school. So Yeah, and I found a, a cool photo online. Uh, so this is of the Elizabeth Street School uh, back in 1930. Wow, so I just like love looking at this picture. Again, another snapshot in time you see. Uh, the vehicles and you see the students there and just the the outline of the school it's like it's still the same today on the outline of the school so it's amazing it's still standing and I sure hope that someone can salvage it uh, yeah. I don't know if they'll be able to follow through on the plans of making it a residential place but how cool would it be if it was a museum or something like that? Oh, Maybe the future home of the Orient. That would be an society. awesome historical society. We'll and, uh, see. But, but yeah, yeah, definitely. I've I've heard I've heard rumors of it being using the rooms as residences and actually mm -hmm. repurposing the chalkboards and repurposing um, the integrity of the school still. Yeah. So. Yeah, let's hope Excited that it doesn't that. go anywhere. Yeah. Awesome. Now, that school opened up in 1927. Mm -hmm. Another school that opened in 1927 is the Proper School. Now, yeah. I think originally that was outside of Lake Orion School District, and eventually the Lake Orion School District incorporated it uh, into the district. But uh, I was just out recently. I had no idea that that's where the school was. It's on Baldwin Road near the Gregory Roundabout. Yep. Uh, what do you know about the Proper School? So the Proper School, yeah. So I have an image of that one, um, but some history behind that one. Like, yeah, I see the video here of the Proper School, but uh, uh, it was an elementary, uh, like Joe was saying, on Baldwin in Gingerville, built in 1927. And uh, originally the Proper School was not named the Proper School. So before that, it was called the Coolidge School. So named after US President Calvin Coolidge at the mm. time. So if you removed that proper school nameplate, you would see that underneath it. Wow. But uh, the reason why the rumor is why it was covered up was uh, Coolidge being Republican did something that irritated the, uh, the mostly Democratic community in Oregon. <laughs> so they're like, okay, we're gonna rename this. So they renamed it the proper school after John and Charlotte Proper who were the first to homestead land in, on Baldwin. So that brown sign was used to cover up the original limestone etching underneath. And uh, today it's still in use. Uh, I believe um, the Lutheran Church or Lutheran, uh, they have um, activities there. Yeah, I found an article uh, that was written in 2006. It says, Gingell House and Proper School sold 
And uh, it says, it appears that the Ginsburg House and Probert School might be spared after all. So it sounds like it was slated for demolition at some point. Oh, uh, plans were in place for a team of developers to purchase the land on Baldwin Road for possible retail and condos. Hmm. Uh, those plans fell through and Mount Zion Church of Clarkston in need of a new location for some of its programs, finalized a deal uh, to buy the what was the old Christ the Redeemer Church. Now, something I just found oh, yeah. uh, out recently, Tracy, who works in our front office, yeah. went to church in that building when it was oh. Christ the Redeemer. Huh. So interesting connection right here in the offices of ON TV. Yeah. Uh, so the Clarkston Christian Association unexpectedly sold their building when a developer offered a too good to refuse offer leading to the purchase of the Baldwin land. So yeah. uh, so it, it started being used by uh, Mount Zion Church, which I believe is still what it okay. does today. And yeah. I think it acts as like a community center for yeah, young Yeah, community people. center. They have programs there from what I've seen on their billboards uh, at the roadside. So, but yeah, that's, you definitely get a good view of it on that roundabout. <laughs> yeah, so next time you're heading down uh, Baldwin Road, take a look if you're going south. Mm -hmm. It's on the uh, east side of Baldwin. And uh, it, it's yes. funny, from the front, it looks like this big, massive building. But as you saw when I went over to the side, it's kind of narrow. It's kind of small. So Yeah, and actually, yeah. like, uh, my father-in-law grew up in this area off of uh, Judah Road. So, you know, he, you know, Ronald Berry is his name, and the Berry family, they grew up on Judah Road. And um, uh, next to um, the guy who does the coffee runs, Oh, Dan. Dan. Dan Dewey. They, yeah, they yeah. were best friends, and uh, they would, you know, run on Mount Judah behind there, they'd call it, yeah. in the big hill. But they would walk to school from Judah Road over to Proper. Wow. So they do remember that school as That's well on amazing. the inside. And it's amazing to hear stories of, you know, from my father-in-law being a uh, Lake Orion, longtime Lake Orion resident. So. Yeah, I just saw Dan Dewey recently, uh, Dan mm. the Coffee Man. Yes. Uh, they're developing a park on Baldwin Road in the Ginjalville area that uh, the land was donated or it was it was sold to Orient Township but at a greatly reduced price yeah. and they're going to put a park uh, over there on uh, oh, Pasadena? Oh, Pasadena Street yeah. and Baldwin. Uh, so that property used to be uh, a garden that was tilled by Michael Gingell. I, I saw oh, Michael Gingell wow. recently I and I told him we were there doing a news story and he says, the reason I don't eat vegetables today is because I had to till and maintain that garden. So I thought that was <laughs> hilarious. But I could imagine it was a lot of work for a young guy. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you should trick him and tell him his services are needed back in the garden. <laughs> Come <laughs> back. <laughs> Now we're gonna jump ahead a little bit to around 1950 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, a Lake Orion's oldest elementary school that stood until recently uh, yeah. was built in uh, downtown Lake Orion in the village and it opened its doors in September of 1950. Mm -hmm. um, now before we get into that, yeah. The name Blant Sims Elementary comes from a longtime beloved teacher named yes. Blant Sims, uh, who not only is the school named after her, but she is currently buried in Evergreen Cemetery. Yes. And uh, we were told that there's going to be a there was a, a ceremony that was going to take place in Evergreen Ceremony. So you and I were both there. I brought my video camera and I don't yeah. know about you, but I learned a, a few things. About I learned a Blaine lot. Sims. Yeah, I didn't know. I, she was part of the one of the first graduating classes yeah. uh, of Orient schools, yeah. 1895. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so let's so. take a look at this video piece uh, and hopefully you'll learn something new about Blanche Sims the person. On a rainy Sunday, June 5th, a group of about 100 people gathered at Evergreen Cemetery in Lake Orion to honor a very special Lake Orion citizen. Blanche Sims taught in Orion schools for 50 years and was a member of Orion High School's class of 1895. Blanche Sims Elementary School was named in her honor when it opened its doors in 1950. Blanche was a founding member of the John Crawford chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, which celebrates its 105th year of existence. But it was recently discovered that her gravestone didn't bear the insignia of the organization and its members decided it was time to rectify that oversight. 
We are here to honor Blanche Sims, one of our founding members. She was one of 20 women who were ahead of their time and saw a need uh, to do volunteerism in their community and in the state. And they followed the guidelines of the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. I think her commitment to education to me is is really outstanding to you know to receive 10 years never absent or tardy doesn't that just like who does that but she does that um, and you know the fact that she was known as you know the most famous woman in Lake Orion and after I learned more about her she, she certainly is among those in attendance was Blanche Sims Elementary School principal Ken Noose, as well as a group of students who performed during the ceremony. He told us he makes sure the students at the school are aware of the contributions Blanche Sims made to education in Lake Orion. As a matter of fact, he brought along the bell she used in her classroom. Uh, that bell has been hanging in uh, Blanche Sims and it was bequeathed to Blanche Sims Elementary, former former teacher, uh, uh, and it was the bell that Blanche Sim used when she was here uh, as a teacher on her desk. And so it's been hanging proudly right next to her plaque with an explanation of the bell and the history of Blanche Sims and everything she did for us, uh, teaching at Blanche Sims for, uh, well it wasn't Blanche Sims, teaching in Lake Orion for 50 years. Also in attendance was Artis Pierce, who was in the school's very first kindergarten class in 1950. I do remember her picture in the hallway and, and knowing about her being um, a, a, a prominent person here in Lake Orion. Construction is currently underway on a brand new Blanche Sims Elementary School, which students will move into for the 23-24 school year. The existing building will then be demolished. In Lake Orion, this is Joe Johnson reporting for ON TV News. So that yeah. story at the end is a little outdated. We have an update on that. But uh, so Blansom Elementary opened in September 1950, like we said, with approximately 850 students in kindergarten through grade six. Uh, yes. Mrs. Vina B. Kirkpatrick was the first principal of this school. Uh, yeah. Anything else you could add about the school? Yeah, well, I have a nice uh, picture of, uh, it's a class picture, so of, this is, Blanche Sims, 1950. There she is. So this, uh, this was shown ceremony. in the ceremony, but yeah, it's a, it's a cool, uh, cool view of like the whole class together with the little nameplate in the front. So, yeah, that was uh, one of the, uh, one of her last pictures there. So. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. And when you and I were at Evergreen Cemetery uh, before that, we had somebody approach us. His name is Dwayne Decker. And we were shooting some video in the cemetery there, and he said, what are you guys doing in here? And uh, we yeah. said, oh, we're, we're doing a little Halloween thing in the cemetery. And we mentioned that we were going to feature Blanche Sims, who's buried in that cemetery. And he said, she was my teacher. So we actually got to meet one of Blanche Sims' students, which was really cool. Yeah. So I got a little bit of him uh, talking, but uh, we'll, we'll work that into a piece when I put together a tribute to the elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, because what I found out just the other day is the old school that's been there since uh, 1950 is now gone. They've demolished it over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, while kids were still attending the school, they were building the new Blansoms Elementary School on the property located behind it. And mm -hmm. they were hoping to get, for the start of this school year, to get the kids into the new school and then demolished the old school. And apparently yep. that happened very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I shot some video. Now, the, uh, what you're gonna see here initially is, uh, this is back from October of last year. Uh, my coworker, Tessa, uh, was invited to go on a tour of Blanche Sims as it was being constructed. Uh, so there it is taking shape on the property uh, behind the existing elementary school and you can see that it's in early early stages of construction um, and so like I said they were still trying to have the kids attend the old school while the new school was being constructed and then when I 
rolled up a couple of days ago to uh, see how the construction was coming mm -hmm. along. To my surprise, the kids had already moved into the new school. Yeah. The first day of the school was after Labor Day. And there is the finished, brand new Blansims Elementary School, open for business. Its hallways are bustling. The kids are in, the teachers are getting settled. And I'm really hoping that they're gonna have an official grand opening ceremony yeah. uh, sometime soon. I would love to, uh, I, I believe there might be a ribbon cutting there. So I'd love to tour the school and see the view and the vantage points and all the upgrades they've done. It'd be yeah. great. So a beautiful new school. Can't wait to get in and see what's going on. They want to get the kids settled uh, before we head in there with our cameras. Yeah. Now I have to admit, as mm. I rolled up on the property the other day, there is a little tinge of sadness because I've spent some time in that school shooting video and, and talking yeah. to staff and the principal and the kids. And um, I feel a little sad knowing that the school is gone now. Uh, some of the things that we've covered in the past is the Kids and Cops program yep. where the Lake Orion Police Department will go into the school and play games with the kids. They brought in a ping pong table that they donated to the school. They had uh, foosball and all sorts of stuff. Yep. So we would go in uh, to cover that. And most recently, back in May, which was the last time that I was in the school, uh, they had a cereal drive to raise food for hungry families. Oh, yeah. And the kids collected hundreds of yeah. boxes of cereal. And if they mm. achieved their goal, they were going to line them up in the hallways of Blanche Sims and then knock them down like dominoes. Uh, so <laughs> I put together, <laughs> I hope this doesn't make you, uh, anyone who spent time at Blanche Sims, I hope this doesn't make you cry. Actually, I kind of hope it does. Uh, but uh, I put together <laughs> this little video of some uh, video over the past year uh, that I had shot at Blanche Sims Elementary School.
So it's amazing how mm. quickly video that I shoot becomes historic. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids and cops footage that you saw there was shot in January of this year. Yeah. Uh, the serial uh, drive with the domino effect that was just shot in May. Right. And little did I know that would be the last time I would ever step foot in that school again. And I was just there in December where every year the, the nighttime Orient Lighted Parade, yep. we'd always have the floats staged there. Yeah, that's there where all the parades, like the Homecoming Parade and all that, yeah. they would all stage at, uh, at okay. Blanche Sims and then work their way down Flint Street. Yeah, yeah so I wonder if that'll be kind of like the key component for this year too, the, the, the headquarters for it. I'm sure it will. Okay. The parking lot is massive as you saw in the video mm -hmm. we showed earlier. and. The, the area where the school used to sit, that's still sort of dirt and there's still some construction equipment there. Yeah. But I don't know what's planned for that part of the property. We'll have to find out what yeah. the future holds. But um, there's that long drive that goes all the way back to the new school and there's the huge parking lot. So I'm sure they'll continue to stage parades there. Yeah, it's, it's such a great venue, great area. Yeah. So uh, let's see. When A.A. A. Reed came to Lake Orion as uh, superintendent of schools in July of 1952, it was during this administration that the district was enlarged and incorporated mm -hmm. the Proper School, which we talked about, yep. the Howarth School, which we're going to talk about in a moment, Carpenter Elementary, Eaton, and Weber Elementary. So this was in 1952 when the district expanded. Now let's talk a little yeah. bit about the Howarth School. Yes. The Howarth School currently sits on property at the uh, Friendship Park. There it is right there. Mm -hmm. And it was moved there. That is not the original location. Um, so apparently it sat at at Silver on Bell? Silver Bell Road near yeah. uh, near Lapeer, and, and uh, that was what two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Orient Historical Society uh, raised money to get it uh, saved and moved to be protected. Yeah, over to currently Friendship Park. Yeah. Where, uh, where recently, we just had uh, uh, it's an ongoing project working with the uh, Lake Orient Rotary Group um, uh, with their grants to fix it up and actually make it a working schoolhouse so we can have field trips and mm. uh, have a little historical piece too with some artifacts and have historical meetings there and have it be available you know all year round so yeah. people can check it out. I would really love to see it come yeah. to life again. Again during my research I stumbled across this article from 2009. Unfortunately I wasn't working here for ON TV at that time and I don't believe anyone on staff at the time shot video of the move which is heartbreaking mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's there's got to be video or photos out there somewhere but this article said uh, how our school was up on its toes ready for the big move workers hoisted the historic schoolhouse onto beams earlier this week and Wednesday the 150 year old building made its way from Silver Bell Road to Friendship Park where a concrete slab awaited it. Uh, so it was three years in the making and at the time Township Supervisor Matt Gibb uh, said he was really excited to see it moved um, and it said this was the first time he checked on it since the moving preparations began. Uh, so it was 2009 when the community mm -hmm. came together and it must have been something to see that school moving down the street oh, toward yeah. Friendship Park. Being its original location built in 1859, I mean being moved from there. I mean, that's probably like a dream, knowing that John Haworth, that school, just didn't go away or just get dismantled and be a part of history, but it'll be some with kids screaming and having fun <laughs> in there again. This, it'd be a great sight to see. And It is you know. a historic uh, site. It yep. has a marker on it. Yep. Uh, the marker reads, John Haworth provided the land on which this Greek revival schoolhouse was built in 1859. The building served the community as a place of worship for the Haworth United Methodist Church and yeah. as an Oakland County School. The Methodists moved to a new building across the road in 1898. However, the building was used as a school until 1955 yeah. when the Orient Township school system was consolidated. Uh, the yeah. church then acquired the building for its vacation Bible school and its annual Christmas bazaar. So. Yeah. And inside still right now has the, the blackboard still there. Wow. And uh, there are some salvaged desks that are there. But uh, I mean, even the wood floor is there. It's creaky. <laughs> There's some spots missing, but uh, <laughs> we can't wait to 
sink our teeth into revitalizing the inside and preserving the history of it on the inside. Mm. Um, and the bell still works. Oh, you that's step great. out, you can still ring the bell. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah I, I can't wait to see that come alive again. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's jump ahead a little bit to 1957. Uh, that is when what is now known as the Cirque Building, but back then was known as yeah. the New High School, uh, was constructed and open mm -hmm. to students. What do you know about uh, that particular high school um, off of Scripps? Yeah, I mean, after, you know, after the, the Emmons Center, that high school, um, they outgrew that and they ended up moving there to what is now known as the Cirque Building. But uh, yeah, we have people in the family that's graduated from there. They had additions onto that building. But uh, an interesting story that I came across was uh, back in the heyday of the, the Bad Boys Pistons when they used to play at the Palace down the road. Um, when the Chicago Bulls came to town, they also want to get their practice in so they actually went right up the road, talked to the um, Lake Orion High School principal and was able to practice in the gym. The Chicago Bulls actually practicing in the, wow. the Cirque Building gym. And it was very, uh, it was very on the down low back then because they didn't want a crowd. Oh, sure. Just a select few. But uh, yeah, today even, you know, my, my kids went there as a Cirque Building for enrichment classes. And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, great to see that it's still being used. Uh, for post-education um, work there. Yeah, I've, uh, excuses that I've had to go inside the building is the Lions Club uh, fill their Christmas baskets in that yeah. gymnasium every year. Uh, it, it's just bustling with activity as food donations come in. They, yeah. they pack up these boxes and deliver them to hungry families in Lake Orion, so I'm there for that every year. Uh, recently, I was there for uh, robotics training. Uh, the robotics team will try out their robots for competition. They have some space uh, set yeah. up there. Uh, obviously, it's a shadow of what it used to be when it was bustling, um, but you may be interested in seeing this video that's coming up. Most people who have grown up here in Lake Orion mm -hmm. uh, today have once gone to that high school. That was their high school. And when I first came out to this community, uh, almost 30 years ago in a couple of months, uh, that was the high school. The new high school was a gleam in someone's eye and mm -hmm. students were still attending there. And one of my interns, uh, whose name at the time was Stephanie Masters, she asked if she can do uh, a news story on the first day of school, 1994. And what's fascinating wow. about this piece is Yes, there was a, uh, people knew that there was a need for a new high school, uh, but you get to see the CERC building bustling with activity and students. So let's take a look at this piece that was put together uh, in 1994. Thursday, August 25th marked the first day of school in the Lake Orion School District. News 65 Stephanie Masters was at the high school and talked to students and staff about the excitement and anxieties associated with going back to school. Behind me stands the high school, already buzzing with activity on this first day of school for the 1994-95 school year. Many changes may be anticipated for the Lake Orion School District in the near future. I spoke with high school principal Ms. Leslie Thurjung about the upcoming bond issue and other notes of special interest. Well, I'm excited to have the students back. I mean, this place is, is a grim place without students. This, we we're meant to have students with us, and uh, so that is just extraordinarily exciting to see them all back and excited to be here and, and I think they like it here I think they like the way the place looks we've prepped it better this year than ever before I think at least that's a feedback I get from students and, and parents who've been in the building um, it looks great we've done a lot of facelift kind of things with paint and uh, in the facilities Lake Orion students and faculty were eager to share their expectations for this school year I'm really excited because it's my senior year and it'd be a lot better if we had like a really cool high school but like the classrooms are really small and there's like a whole bunch of people and we're all crammed in little spaces and it's really hot and like going down the hallways like rush hour traffic in downtown Detroit at 7 30 in the morning. Well my excitement for the school year I couldn't sleep all last night first day of the year I do this every year I'm wide awake and just as I'm falling asleep, it's time to get up and go to work. I'm really excited to be back. I miss all the students. I told myself a long time ago, if I didn't want to come back, I wasn't coming back. And I still get excited to start school, so I'm really happy to be here. 
I'm excited about the year. I hope hopefully it's going to be a good year. And I've had good experiences with my teachers. A couple of them have been real funny, and some of them are like a brick wall. But I just think I still have a good year. Yeah, it's fun. I'm kind of nervous. I'm not. I don't have a lot of classes with my friends, but I like it so far. Ms. Thurjong addressed changes that occurred over the summer, including the moving of a physics lab, the remodeling of the women's locker room, a new track, women's golf being added to the athletic program, additions in curriculum, and the change of positions for high school assistant principal of four years, Dr. Sherry Anderson. On the minds of faculty and many Lake Orion students is the bond issue. On September 26th, voters will make a decision regarding three separate proposals. The first includes the building of a new high school and elementary school. The second proposal addresses the remodeling and refurnishing of present school buildings and the acquiring of more school buses. The final proposal suggests the addition of a swimming pool to the new high school building. Ms. Leslie Thurjung shared her thoughts on the bond proposals. We need a new high school desperately, as well as all the other issues addressed by, the, by our bond issue. Um, we are growing rapidly. I mean, we have an a large number of new enrollees this year and our, our student enrollment at the high school will be somewhere between 80 and 100 additional students. We anticipate. Those are not final figures, but that's what we are anticipating. And we are just one building. I think the elementary certainly are seeing that in, even in a greater uh, level than we are. We do have classrooms in this building that cannot house more than 22 students. We have cl uh, uh, science classrooms that cannot house students in a desk. They have to sit on radiators or on lab tables in order to be instructed. Um, that is not a way to do quality education. We also believe strongly in the fine and performing arts area in, this, in, our, in, our, in our district, certainly in our school, and we don't have any facilities um, that reflect the kind of commitment we want to make to those kinds of programs and students. And we know that a lot of students are very gifted in that area, and we don't have a place for students to perform to really develop those talents in the ways that they could. So we need an auditorium. Uh, we believe strongly in, in getting a pool. Um, we know that our students live near or on the lake in this area, and we don't have the facilities or capability of instructing them. No matter the outcome of the bond, it looks like Lake Orion can expect another great year of academic excellence from its schools. For News 65, I'm Stephanie Masters. Isn't that amazing to see that yeah. building bustling? But it's also painfully obvious that it had outgrown that space. Uh, mm -hmm. These were boom years for Lake Orion, and there was new developments, which meant new students and influx of kids, and so that school got really, really crowded, and as you heard from some of those interviews, it was hot, apparently there was no AC. Yeah. Um, so things were getting very, very uncomfortable there in 94, and the new high school was still several years away. Yeah, it's 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 amazing because I you know I went to high school around that time period too, in another city. But yeah, yep, yep, same thing in our city. We had to vote on a, on a new high school, but uh, yeah, it, it was time. <laughs> yeah, so that school was uh, was built, and then follow that was fifty seven. Uh, over the next uh, several years, the junior high school was built in nineteen sixty five. Uh, the administrative offices, 1967, that's over by the, uh, the uh, Elizabeth Street School. Yeah. Uh, Walden Junior High, which is now the middle school uh, stadium, Pine Tree Elementary, uh, those were built in 72, 73. Um, and now I wonder, too, like you mentioned Elizabeth Street School, like the, the administration building near there. Like I, I found like this tidbit of information about um, during World War II, an eight room building was built next to the school, which was named the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Street Elementary School. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, is that the same similar area of where the admin buildings are? Yeah, at? it but, might uh, be. I don't know. You know, I don't know, if, you know what happened to that place, but yeah. But I just uh, I couldn't locate it anywhere or a picture. <laughs> yeah. I can't help but wonder if they demolished it and built the administrative buildings, I guess. Yeah. Now, speaking of the Elizabeth Street School, when the, when the new high school over on Scripps opened, the uh, former high school uh, still was in use at the time, uh, but mm -hmm. they renamed it the Fred Eamon Center. And as I was doing yeah. some research for this particular show, I was shocked to stumble on to a program from 1987 called Teacher Talk, which I believe was produced over at the high school. 
Uh, and the principal at the time, who was, or not principal, mm -hmm. superintendent at the time, he yep. was principal of the Scripps, or not the Scripps, the Elizabeth Street School. Yep. Then he became superintendent of com Lake Orion Community Schools, and he continued to be superintendent until 1988. Yep. He was invited to be a guest on Teacher Talk, and I had never <laughs> seen this video before. So yeah. if you know the name Fred Eamon and you've seen his name on that building, here is a sample of what Fred Eamon looked and sounded like. Welcome to the second half of Teacher Talk. My guest this evening is uh, Mr. Fred Eamon, who is superintendent of Lake Orion Schools. Um, we were talking earlier about the millage, but I'd like to change the subject a little bit right now and talk about you more. Um, how long have you been in this district? This is my 30th year. 30th year. So. You, you started here as a teacher then, I presume? Yes, I started as an elementary teacher in uh, what was the junior high, but it uh, had grades five, six, and then the junior high. It's now the Community Education Center, or Elizabeth Street School, as we call it. How has Lake Orion changed uh, in the last 30 years? Well, there's been a, a, quite a population change. Uh, it used to be quite a resort community, and so we had a lot of people that uh, would live in the lake, around the lake during the summertime and then move back to the city in the, in the fall and mm -hmm. in the winter. So it's changed in that sense. It's always been, uh, or I won't say always, but for many years, a community where most of the workers were connected with uh, General Motors or one of the automotive companies. And, mm -hmm. and that still is true and maybe in some cases different capacities. But I think one of the biggest changes that I've noticed is the needs of, of our students and uh, the families, if you will. I think back when I first began, uh, PTAs uh, were very strong and the schools were the center of most of the activities uh, mm -hmm. of the family. That's changed dramatically in that uh, we have a, a big increase in single parent families, uh, as well as where both the father and the mother work. And so the needs of the family have changed as far as what the school might do. So that's pretty yeah. amazing to see Fred Eamon. Yeah. And to hear him talk about one of the major changes that he witnessed is families going from a single income household to a dual income household. Like back then, that was sort of a, a new problem. Today it's so commonplace, but back then it yeah. was kind of new. And it was new, yeah. yeah. And so he talked about how the school had to establish mm -hmm. a latchkey program for, oh. pa for when parents had to go to work, they would drop their kids off hours before school would open yeah. and they would play games and they would be under in this safe environment until s school started. Then they would go back to the latchkey and wait for the parents to get off work to pick them up. So that was a relatively I, new concept. I wonder, I wonder if he uh, invented that, because uh, <laughs> I was wondering, like, where did that come from? Yeah. But uh, there was a, a photo that somebody sent us um, from, this is actually from the Elizabeth Street School 1973-74 class photo uh, I have here from 1973. So he's, he's pictured here in the upper left-hand corner. Yep. And, and it, at the time, he was principal, right? At the time, so, yep, he was yeah. principal. And then uh, it was said that he provided five years of stability and improved the credibility of the Orient School District as a superintendent uh, up until 1988. And um, yeah, the, that Elizabeth Street School was ended up renamed uh, the Fred Amon Center for Lifelong Learning yeah. and, uh, by the Board of Education. So that's a, a great honor. Now, I remember in the 90s, uh, mid-90s, when I came out to this community, mm -hmm. the Elizabeth Street School is where they would hold some of these latchkey programs where kids would get dropped off and picked up at, at the, uh, the yeah. Elizabeth Street School, the Eamon Center. So, yeah, I don't know if he was instrumental in creating that latchkey program or not, but it, did, it definitely happened under his watch. So. Oh, yeah, it grew fast. It seemed like this area grew really fast. It was a definite need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like so it was really neat to see Fred Eamon for the first time, at least for me, and maybe that's that was the first time for you, too. So that's a little bit of history right there. Yeah. Now, like I said, I came out to this community in late uh, De December 1993, so I'm coming up on my 30th year here in the Lake Orion community. And from that time on, things were just exploding here in Lake Orion school-wise. New mm -hmm. teachers were being hired. 
they have to, had to pass this millage so that they were able to build new schools to accommodate this influx of students coming to Lake yeah. Orion in the 90s. It was a, a boom time. time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the schools that opened up when I first got out here is located right next to us. Uh, we're here in the Orion Center on, on Joslin Road and just to our north is Orion Oaks. And it's amazing to think that at one time that was a vacant field when I first came out here. Uh, they ended up breaking ground on that after the millage was passed. There was desperate need for a new elementary school and it was the first new elementary school built in the Lake Orion School District in years, if not decades. Mm. And so they had a groundbreaking and then the school opened uh, to students in 1996. Now they hosted an open house in, uh, I think the week leading up to the first day of school. And what's interesting about this particular video clip is you get to see the school under construction and then I tried to deliberately stand in those same spots when the school had opened for the open house to sort of compare and contrast those locations and how much they had changed. So here's a look at Orion Oaks when it first opened its doors to the public for an open house. Students and parents were able to take a sneak peek at their new school on Thursday, August 22nd during an open house. For many of them, it was the first time to step inside the school. Students were able to meet their teachers and examine the layout of the building, which includes the neighborhood concept of classrooms. The concept is just one of many features that makes Orion Oaks unique. One of, I think, the key factors that makes Orion Oaks special is that we are a school of choice, like Carpenter, year-round. And what that means is that every child uh, and parent that are here are here because they chose to be here. And I think another key issue is that the staff is here because they chose to be here. We went through a process uh, working with the staff to bring people here who wanted to be a part of Orion Oaks with its multi-age concept, uh, technology, and school of choice. Orion Oaks has been described as the technology school, and venturing into the media center or any one of the classrooms demonstrates why. In researching technology uh, integration in the classroom, uh, what we looked at and concluded was that lower L students uh, need to learn basic skills uh, and doing through that with uh, computer and technology integration. Lower L classrooms have three computers, upper L classrooms have four computers, and we have a commons area where we're housing um, an additional three computers. Uh, we also have, um, as do um, a lot of our other schools in Lake Orion, we have fax machines, we have um, a number of other types of technology for student use. In March of this year, we here at News 65 had the opportunity to visit the school with members of the school board while it was still under construction. Comparing the video shot then with video shot at the open house demonstrates the progress that has been made in five short months. with you. Uh, the most important thing for me was to see student reaction. I personally have spent about 18 months uh, working with this project. It's been a, a once in a lifetime opportunity for, for anyone and um, it's just uh, I have goosebumps and if anyone knows me I think they, they will understand. I am 
this tonight was more exciting, I think, than Monday will be because it's the first time our kids actually had an opportunity to come in and see their school. Isn't it amazing <laughs> to see Orion yeah. Oaks with dirt floors? And yeah. it, it's shocking to think that in my brain, Orion Oaks is a brand new school, but they just recently underwent major renovations itself. And the facade, the exterior of the school looks completely different now. Yeah, I drive by it all the time. I live near there and yeah, my sons yeah. went there and just to see that change happen. Yeah. And I wasn't here for the groundbreaking, but you know, there was, uh, when my sons were going there, one of the teachers told me a story about one of the NBA players who plays in the NBA now uh, John Henson, he ended up getting traded to the Pistons back in 2020, and he talked about, yep, I grew up in Lake Orion, and wow. I went to, uh, went to Orion Oaks, and I used to get in trouble for hanging on the rims. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, being tall for his age, I mean, he took advantage of that. <laughs> yeah. Now, in, in that footage, you'll, you'll see they had a school bell hanging above the entrance, mm. and when I saw the renovations, that school bell was gone. I was like, oh, no, what happened to the school bell? Apparently, it's still on display in the school. I haven't seen it yet, but they saved oh. the school bell, and oh. it's uh, still part of the school. Oh, so. good. There's so many elementary schools in this area. It's, it's yeah. Now, around that same time, again, they, the community had passed a millage, and the other major need, uh, other than an elementary school, was a new high school. The community was in desperate need of a new high school. So I remember at the time, the millage went out to the voters, and they approved the new high school, but they, they nixed the new swimming pool. And that kind of threw things out of whack because they were hoping to build the school mm -hmm. with a swimming pool, but voters said no to a swimming pool. But then they went to voters again, I don't know if it was a year later or whatever, and the second attempt, the, the voters approved the swimming pool. So eventually they were able to mm -hmm. build the, the new school. Now, we have two packages here. The first one you're gonna see uh, is the groundbreaking on the vacant parcel of land where the current high school Ooh, never seen now it. sits. Let's take a look at the groundbreaking. Officials, school faculty, administration, and students gathered near the existing high school for a ceremony marking a significant moment in the district's history. Members of the school board were the first to plant shovels into the ground, celebrating the start of construction of the new high school. Trying to hold back a lot of emotion, Joe, because it, it for me, is very, very emotional. Um, symbolically, it begins the future. We step from here into the next world, and we have to take the stuff out of this world with us, and it it feels that way. I was thrilled that there were so many people to be a part of that. I think we had a real representation of what school is. It's, it's a part of every part of a community and, and they were all here to be a part of this in one way or another and actively participated before this point in time. So I, it's a feeling of such excitement it's almost numbing. It's just very exciting. Uh, this has been a long process, even long before I came to the school district. Citizens had worked toward a new building. Today, I think we're right at the front door of really ensuring that building will open in 23 months. Well, I've been, uh, along with other people in the community, working a long time to get a new high school for this district. And what's going through my head is I'm pinching myself. <laughs> you know, it finally arrived. and. Uh, it's just a great feeling to know that we'll be able to provide this structure for kids to learn in. Construction will actually begin in a few weeks on 100 acres of property just east of the groundbreaking ceremony. When completed, the state-of-the-art school will be able to house 1,600 students comfortably. About 950 10th, 11th, and 12th graders attend the current high school. The new school will house an estimated additional 300 ninth graders when it opens in just under two years. So you saw Robert Bass in that video. He was a superintendent of schools at the time, and he really led the district through some major, major changes in growth uh, during that time period where I came out here to uh, the district. And uh, you saw Tony Rothschild. He was former president of the school board. He passed mm -hmm. away a number of years ago. Uh, really, really great guy who, mm -hmm. again, that board and that administration really led the district through some major growth. Uh, so then, uh, two years after the groundbreaking, the new high school was open for business. Uh, we weren't there on day one, but we were there the first week that the school opened to the public. Let's take a look. Though you might not know it by looking at it, the new high school opened its doors to students on time the morning of August 26th. We visited the school later that week to see how things were coming along. 
Give credit to the staff and faculty who spent a good part of the summer moving from the former high school for making sure the doors opened on time. Taking a tour of the new school revealed that most of the classrooms were full and teachers were busy getting their lesson plans up and going. More than 1,800 people are using the new building, including, for the first time, ninth graders. For staff and faculty, I think it's been a, a transformation from what we were used to to what the facility, you know, now that we are able to occupy. Um, there's just really no comparison between the two. So I guess it's sort of been like a, an awakening and a transformation. Um, and with that comes getting used to things and a lot, you know, some stress. Um, some insecurity and instability, um, but in spite of all that, faculty and staff by 8 o'clock Monday morning were in classrooms teaching kids and, um, and students were learning. You know, they talk about being confused and being frustrated and having to find their way. Um, and we know that's going to happen and we have many volunteers on site to help people find their places. But by day two, I was amazed at the large number of students who went where they knew they needed to go. It was fantastic. If you look at the exterior of the building, you'll see that construction was continuing even after the first day of school. Yet to be completed is the school gymnasium, the auditorium, and the swimming pool. Until construction is complete, auto tech and engineering classes, band and choral, and physical education classes will be held at the former high school. Still under construction are the auditorium, the gymnasium, the pool, which is what you're seeing in the front edifice of the building, um, which is, you know, surrounded by a fence and drywalled off from the interior of the school, from access from us in the school to those areas. All of that is still going on, and with that is the exterior construction, the parking lot, sidewalks, uh, brick laying, all that kind of stuff that goes with that. But those are the major areas still under construction. Some of the highlights of our tour, led by parent volunteer Debbie Stevens, included stops in the 150-seat Kiva a conference room to be used for large group meetings or lectures, the Information Resource Center, or library to you and me, and the teachers' offices. At the new school, classrooms are shared by teachers, but each teacher has his or her own office. When, you, when I sit back and reflect on it, I realize that it's just a, it's a monumental time for Lake Orion. It, um, the moving from that school to this school, what this school is and what it represents to this community. I mean, this is a community project from beginning of inception, planning, design, construction, and now to the implementation, because we have, any day, 20-some parents here who are helping navigate, helping students, helping secretaries, teachers, administrators do things, all on a voluntary basis. And uh, they know more about the facility than some of us, because they've been in every nook and cranny taking tours of of students and parents a couple weeks ago and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's I guess, a very community effort. Mm -hmm. uh, that phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, you know, it, it, this has been every one of us mm -hmm. have had to, to make this work. It couldn't be just paid school staff. So it's amazing to think that was more than 25 years ago, that that school was brand new, uh, yeah. opened its doors for the first time. I, I was thinking as I was watching that video that many of the students you see there are in their 40s, closing in on their 50s, <laughs> have children yes. that have probably gone through the Lake Orion Community yep. Schools. Yep. Uh, it blows my mind and I hope yeah. those of you watching may have spotted yourself or someone you know in that video. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the cool thing about going out into the community and covering the events in, in this community is you don't realize it at the time that you're documenting history and the next thing you know 25 years go by and people could now go back and see what this community was like all those years ago. Yeah and, and it flew by really really fast. It so, sure <laughs> did. I can't believe when you said that was 97. I'm like, seems yeah. like yesterday to me. <laughs> and that guy hosting the newscast he hasn't changed a bit. No. <laughs> 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 so, um, and so the last video clip that I have, uh, that same year in 1997, I remember going to a school board meeting. I can't remember what was on the agenda, but I used to go to the school board meetings before they were televised live, mm -hmm. and I would cover them for our newscast. And about three days after I was at the meeting, uh, we received word that the school administration building had burned 
and mm. there was we, we mentioned his name in the in the video piece you'll see but uh, a resident who lived across the street from the administration building caught it on video and was gracious enough to give us a call and, and ask if we wanted to use the video on our newscast. So uh, take a look at this piece of the uh, school administration building fire in 1997. On Wednesday, February 5th, the school board held what turned out to be the last meeting ever to be held in the district's administrative building. Just three days later, the building that houses the boardroom was destroyed by fire. On Saturday, February 8th, Travis Simmons captured the scene on video. Lake Orion's Volunteer Fire Department was dispatched at 5.18 p.m. Chief Jeffrey Key was the first one to arrive on the scene. A short time later, fire trucks arrived but could not save the building. Well, we had a, uh, a large volume of fire coming out the north and west corner of the building, heavy smoke from, from the rest of the building. Well, we were on the scene till uh, nearly midnight, but uh, quite a long, most of that time was spent putting, uh, putting on hot spots and overhauling the fire. Well, the investigation is being handled primarily uh, through the uh, fire investigators at the Sheriff's Department and uh, we'll be working with them and uh, with any luck we'll come up with a cause and, and trying to you know, be able to determine exactly why the fire ca uh, occurred. It was later determined that an electrical fire was the origin of the blaze. Employees were in the building just hours before the fire started but reported nothing unusual. Two firefighters received minor injuries battling the blaze. So yeah, a lot of files were lost in that fire, and I mm -hmm. remember there was some discussion at the time about uh, whether or not to move the administration offices uh, to someplace else. They may have gone yeah. over to the Eman Center for a little while. Uh, they eventually decided, of course, to build brand new building on the site of the former yeah. uh, building, and that's the one that uh, stands today. Uh, since that, since the opening of the new high school and the new ad uh, administration building, uh, the Cirque building, the former high school, became the Cirque building in 1998. Uh, in 2000, Paint Creek Elementary School opened its doors. Uh, the, what used to be part of the grounds of Weber Elementary, the Moose Tree Nature Preserve, uh, was built yeah. and created. And uh, currently the Orient Arts Center teaches classes yeah. and stuff Pottery, at the yeah. uh, Moose Tree. And Oakview Middle School opened its doors in 2002. Now I heard about Oakview Middle School. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's true or not. I heard that there was a movie that was filmed there oh, in the, the back. It was I don't like know, a tornado was it? movie? Or yeah, something? yeah, yeah. They had like a disheveled school bus on its side yeah, or yeah. something like that. But yeah, I'm like, I didn't know if that's true. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Huh. Um, a controversial decision that was made is uh, the school district closed Pine Tree Elementary School to students. Yes. Those students were then sent to other nearby elementary schools. And then it reopened as the Pine Tree Center in 2018 for special needs students. Yes. And uh, they did a really great job converting in that school. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one of the more recent developments here, again, just down the road from us here at the Orient Center, uh, the district uh, broke ground and opened the Early Childhood Center uh, in 2021. So yeah. the changes keep coming, the developments keep happening, and, and yep. the growth keeps coming. There's new residential uh, buildings that are going to be going in and along uh, Lapeer Road. Um, mm -hmm. There's always new developments, new families, new kids coming to the district and uh, yep. going to Lake Orion schools. Yeah, and I, I like how, um, you know, the schools keep including, you know, the, even naming these schools. There's thought behind it, you know, so you, know, you talk about the Weber Elementary School that that actually has there is somebody named Weber. It wasn't like they just came up with that. So there was a yeah. Weber. So I, I found some information on just where did Weber come from. Mm -hmm. So Oscar Weber actually had a farm right down the road off Clarkson Road. He was the manager of JL Hudson Company in Detroit. And uh, him and John Lambert purchased farms around Dennis Lake in 1914 in that area. They developed 1,200 acres of the Lakefield Farms along Clarkson Road. So they had cows, they had, so the, the yellow building you see on Clarkson Road, um, you know, just, just south of Baldwin there. Um, there was the yellow building and across the street, it was like the quarters where they lived in. Um, it was Picasso's grapevine for a little bit. But uh, yeah, Weber, so he supported uh, education. And in 1927, he donated 30 acres on Clarkson Road uh, part of his farmland, which became that um, a two-room schoolhouse that replaced the Shanghai School, which was another school I couldn't find any photos on. Hmm. Another's just small schoolhouse, but it was called the Shanghai School, and I didn't know 
where that uh, where the name came from originated um, and then was named the Weber School so that same area developed into the the Weber Elementary uh, yeah so that was I have that as like 1956 when the wow. Weber Elementary and I just didn't know they had uh, Weber had ties to J.L. Hudson and mm -hmm. and even like if you visit that uh, house where Oscar Weber lived that farmland there's even parts of uh, J.L. Hudson's the, the department store in Detroit so the flooring was moved so there's some fixtures and some flooring wow. some cases that are still in that uh, in, in that building Wow so it's uh, it's amazing to you know keeping the name Weber was great and then also just right down the road you have the the Nina Scripps School which mm -hmm. nobody knew existed as there was a little school there and it's uh, on the land where Canterbury Village is at there's this stone um, looking it's a little it's a church now that's there and it's uh, on the same side of the road as Canterbury just just south of Canterbury Village but that was the Nina Scripps School named after Nina Scripps obviously um, and that was for the farmers had children so they needed uh -huh. a place to get their education so it's like well let's build a school on the property yeah. so she she did a lot of things for the area as well but uh, Man, so much history here. Yeah. Speaking of naming schools, I neglected yeah. to mention that when uh, they were planning Orion Oaks, there were several names that were considered for uh -oh. Orion Oaks. Obviously, it got its name because of the surrounding parkland. Uh, but one of the names that was proposed at the time was Mildred E. Williams School, who was a longtime school board member and uh, the grandmother of one of my best friends. And she lived in a house uh, on uh, Lapeer Road, right on the shore of the lake. And yeah. her family lived there for a long time, but it recently got demolished. Yeah. Um, but yeah, imagine that could have been named the Mildred E. Williams School, but they went with Oyo. Yeah. So yeah, fascinating little tidbit. So. Yeah, didn't know that. <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed our back to school special of where living is a vacation. So much history and there were things we sort of glossed over just because of time constraints but we hope you learned something new we hope you enjoyed the program Jimmy thanks again for coming out thank you Joe for having me this is great I learned so much from you every time I'm here <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll be planning our next one and uh, I heard that they're going to be doing a, a haunted tour of the cemetery similar to what we had done uh, oh. a couple of years ago so maybe Ooh. we'll do some Halloween stuff it's right around the corner uh, but until then, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Where Living is a Vacation.